Namaste. So let's take a look at the final two chapters of the Srishti Khanda of Rudra Sanghita of Shiva Purana. This completes the story of Gunanidhi, and it also completes the whole chapter, the whole section. So what happens to Gunanidhi after he gets a lot of mercy <laughs> and gets rescued from his sinful existence as the son of a brahmana? He becomes a king, and then he performs a lot of pious activities. And after that, he becomes the ruler of one of the directions, the guardian of one of the quarters. So, and in chapter 19, he is called Shrida. Shrida means beautiful gift. So, it's a fitting name because he got a very beautiful gift from Shiva and Devi. He got to be rescued from almost certainly going to hell and becoming a pious king. And it says a little bit later on that after becoming the guardian of the quarter, he spent 200,000 years in penance, which he can do because now he's like a demigod. And he realized his identity with Shiva. Now, this is a very important point because now he goes on to become Kubera. Kubera is the treasurer of the demigods and the treasurer of Shiva also. So how does this sinful rascal <laughs> become transformed into the treasurer of the demigods? Well, along the way, he realized his identity with Shiva. This is the real point. It's just in one short sentence, but it actually makes the whole story make sense. And after that, Shiva and Uma appear to him. And at first, he's like blinded by the glare, you know, of Shiva's effulgence. He can only see Uma. And he's just amazed at her beauty. And I mean, he's so amazed that his left eye explodes. <laughs> So that also is another one of Kubera's traits, that he only has one eye. So how is it, this is a possible contradiction or a possible um, uh, sticking point that we have to resolve. How is it, if he realized his identity with Shiva, that then he also becomes the eternal friend of Shiva as Kubera? See, he didn't even have to ask. Shiva knew what was in his mind and automatically benedicted him with this wonderful position just nearby Kailash in Alaka. And I think that's not the real point. I think the real point is that he has eternal devotion for Shiva as a friend. And now, why does he also identify with Shiva? Well, see, that is the point that I've been trying to make in many different series here, that moksha comes before mukti. Moksha means the realization that I am Brahman, I am Shiva, Aham Brahmasmi, Shivoham. See? The nature of one's self is spiritual. Pure consciousness, pure awareness. And so this has to be realized before one can have an eternal relationship with anybody, especially Shiva, because, I mean, look at it this way. If you were Shiva, you wouldn't want to have a relationship with anybody unless they were on the same platform. So Shiva requires many helpers and assistants 
and uh, demigods and so on to administer all the different departments of the universe. And they have to be in constant association with him. So he wants them to be of a similar quality to himself. He doesn't want to have a close associate, you know, the, uh, that don't match his own elevated nature. You know, it's just like, for example, if you want to have a close friend or a marriage partner or a life partner, you want someone who is similar to yourself, isn't it? You don't want somebody who comes from a very different family or socioeconomic background. It's just common sense that this kind of person will have, be a much, much more stable partner, a much more understanding partner, if they come from the same background, if they have a similar nature. So similarly, when Shiva is recruiting people to help him manage the universe as Rudra, he wants people who have realized the self, just like he has. Well, he is the self. <laughs> we all are. So he doesn't want people around him that are still struggling with the fear of birth and death, with karma. He wants people who are free. So he takes the people who have uh, moksha. And then he gives them one of the five kinds of mukti. And of course, the five kinds of mukti are living on the same planet of, as the Lord, having similar features as the Lord, being a close associate of the Lord, having similar powers as the Lord, and merging into the Lord's identity. So we see that actually Kubera, uh, or Shrida, or Gunanidhi, or whatever you're going to call him, developed all these qualities by the grace of Shiva at Uma. So he was therefore fit to be an eternal close associate and friend of Shiva. These stories, you see, are more than just stories. They embody deep points from the Vedic philosophy and especially the philosophy of liberation, of salvation. In fact, the Puranas in general are about the drama of salvation, the process of liberation. And they contain many stories of devotees and sages who attain success in the matter of self-realization. And that's really the point, I think, of all the Puranas in general, that there is a way to overcome material suffering, to attain the mercy of God, to be elevated to a very high spiritual position and to continue to exist as a person, but without an ego, without a sense of separate identity, being one with God, being totally in tune. I mean, isn't this what people crave for love? They want to be completely in tune with someone else. Everyone has this craving, everyone has this desire, and it's very deep. The problem is, of course, that when you're dealing with conditioned beings, nobody has the same desire. Everyone has some different purpose, some different idea what they want to do. And so there is inevitable conflicts leading to the breaking of the relationship, breaking of the intimacy or the bond of togetherness. So this earthly love is, uh, is simply a temporary illusion. It, it doesn't really solve the problem. It doesn't really satisfy the desire that we have for closeness and relationship. The kind of relationship that we have with Shiva is called achintya bheda bheda. It means inconceivable oneness and difference simultaneously. So at the same time that we are one with Shiva, 
we also have a separate sense of self and separate activities and so on. And somehow or other, there is no conflict between the two. I think uh, this would be a nice topic for a video in, in itself. We could look up some scriptural references and try to understand how this is possible. But basically, Shiva wants to be surrounded with people who are self-realized. It's very understandable. I do too. <laughs> I don't want to be surrounded by idiots. But in this world, idiots is like 99.9999%. So the problem is then finding the people who understand these things, even if they haven't realized them, if they at least understand properly. But this is also very rare. So what to do? Well, this is why we have sadhana and we have mantras that bring us into tune and into touch with Shiva and other forms of Godhead. And these give great relief to the miseries of separate existence where we feel alienated from others. We feel like we have no real companionship because everybody is on a different trip, you know. So when we get this liberation, when we realize who we really are, what we really are, at that point we become eligible for salvation, one of the five kinds of mukti. So then the uh, Lord gives us a form of relationship with him that is exactly suitable to our nature. And you might say, well, he created us that way in the first place. And it's true, he did. His intention from the beginning in creating each and every one of us as a work of art, as an individual with unique traits and desires and so on, is that he wants an eternal associate who has particular qualities and nature. So he makes us in his own image ultimately to supply some need or desire of his. And that's the way it should be. I mean, that's, that's what being God is all about, right? You create the world that you like, that you want, that works for you. And all of us have the same ability just to a lesser degree. We're made of the same stuff. In fact, we are Brahman. We are Shiva. But we have to realize it before we become capable of really putting that into action or realizing it in practice. That's why I always recommend, and so do the scriptures, performance of sadhana. That one should perform the sadhana as described in these chapters, in this whole section, in the, in the first part of the Srishti Khanda, I guess it's five or six chapters or more just describing different rites of how to please Shiva. Simply by hearing these chapters, one earns pious credit and approaches liberation. But doing the sadhana, doing those rites, is even more powerful. And this is how the great devotees become realized and get freedom from material existence and suffering. So next, we'll go into the Sati Khanda and hear about the goddess. But first, I'm going to take a little break. <laughs> so we'll be back with the continuation of this series in a week or two. Meanwhile, please continue your sadhana and enjoy this wonderful relationship with Shiva. Om Tat Sat, Om Shakti Om, Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs>